Father God, we come before you, Lord, so thankful. Lord, thankful that you've loved us, that you've called us, that you have called us by name, Lord, and that you have spoken into our lives and shown us a glimpse of who you are as our creator, as our redeemer, as our savior, as God and as Father. Lord, we thank you for loving us unconditionally, for calling us through your Son, and, and Lord, communing with us through your Spirit. Lord, this morning we just desire to lift up one voice in praise and worship for who you are, your person. Lord, we praise you for all the things that you've done, for all the things that you're going to do, for all the things that you're doing, but God, we worship you for who you are the one, the infinite I am, and we praise you today, and we bring our worship, and Lord, we lift up our hands, and we cry out, oh God, give us clean hands, creating us clean hearts, finish that good work which you have begun in us, perfect us, and establish us, and strengthen us. Lord, cause us that our hope would abound through the power of your spirit. Lord, that you would use us as your hands and your feet in a world that is so hurting, that is so broken, that is so confused. And Lord, that we would truly be your hands and your feet, the light of the earth, the salt of the world. Bless us now, we pray. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen to on the Jericho Road? Did you learn it? I did. I never know what part to sing. Is that a bad thing? I end with one part, and the second part sounds good, so I start with that. Music confuses me, Gordon, so you just have to work with people like me. Just shaking his head back there. Yeah, I understand. I hear you. Well, I do appreciate that. That was a wonderful blessing. And uh, Brother Bruce, thank you for, for suggesting that. It's good to be in the Lord's house. I'm thankful that we weren't snowed in. My dad sent me a few pictures of his house. He's up north about three hours of us, and they're pretty much snowed in. They've canceled church. So, so he said he would listen to me on the YouTube, so hopefully I better do a good job, right? Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be here. And I trust that this is a culmination of a great week between you and the Lord, amen? That your walk with the Lord God is not just about an hour or two a week, but that it's a relationship. It's a living, dynamic, breathing relationship. And, and I know we have many guests here today, and I just pray that, that uh, you are encouraged to seek the Lord, that you are encouraged that something here that is said in worship, in song, in message, uh, uh, reveals a, a glimpse of the glory of the Lord and that you see that glory and you want more of it. And that you go from this place and say, you know, there's something to uh, this Christianity. There's something to serving God that I want more of. And I pray uh, for all of us that prayer, but if you're a visitor, I pray especially for, that, uh, uh, for you in that regard today. Amen. We need to know the answers to life, don't we? What are we here for? What's our purpose? What's the meaning of life? Amen. And in, in this book, the Bible, God gives us those answers. And, and we were discussing this in class, but how sad is it that uh, most of the world never thinks about the big questions of life, never crosses their mind. And yet the Lord would have us consider, uh, who am I? What is my purpose? What is the meaning of life? What is right and wrong? Where will I go after I die? The Lord wants us to ponder those questions and uh, by his grace seek those answers that are found in the word of God. Again, I want to welcome you here and uh, if you're new, uh, we have a bulletin insert. These are just some points that I'll be covering in the message if you want to use that to help follow along a little bit. Amen. Malachi. Malachi is the very last book in the Old uh, Testament, the Old Testament. It's a, 
It's, it's only four chapters, uh, but it's a powerful book. These chapters, if you read them, you'll realize that they're direct, they're confrontational. Let me give you one, uh, just snippet, one example. Malachi, uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks to the priests, the, the spiritual leadership, and he tells the spiritual leadership of his day, you offer defiled food on my, offer, uh, on my uh, altar. And so you can, you can just immediately, you can just see that Malachi uh, truly was uh, direct and to the point. And that's just a small example. He, he furthers, he says, offer it to your governor. You bring to me your leftovers. Now try that with the governor of the land. And, and uh, he, he, uh, he, was, uh, he didn't, uh, wasn't afraid to, uh, to confront. But he also spoke, uh, he also spoke to God's people in a way that comforts, amen? And we love that, and it's needed. And he declares, here's a snippet of that. He declares of God to Israel, I have loved you, says the Lord. Don't we all want to hear that from the Lord? That communion and power of the, the Holy Spirit speaking into our spirits that God, God says, I love you, I have loved you, I love you. Irreplaceable, amen? And we need that, and so... Uh, God used Malachi to confront, and God used Malachi to comfort. And Malachi is one of the smallest books in the Bible. And, if, and as I was looking into this, uh, I realized that the length of Malachi is the length of about a, a, a typical half-hour sermon. And if you have ears to hear, it will change your life. And as I think about Malachi, and I think about the books that God has preserved in the scriptures, and I, I consider how small the book of Malachi is. It's a reminder, isn't it, that our words are important. How powerful words can be. How powerful they can be. For here, God has preserved this little half-hour message for time and eternity. Think about that. This little half-hour message message been preserved now for millennia thousands of years thousands of years and it's a reminder of how important and powerful even our 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 little words can be right malachi is a book that can strengthen us in our walk with the lord and because of that it's it's so worthy of our time and our study and indeed it is the word of god amen the word of God, don't neglect it, don't leave it on your shelf, but pull it off that shelf and begin to, to, to read it, begin to digest it, just begin to dwell on it and see what God does. Amen? He's faithful to meet us there. Can you say amen? He is faithful to meet us as we are just take that small step of pulling that book off the shelf and reading it and spending time in it. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. Just take your time and see what God does. It's, it's uh, interesting about this book that, as of course, as the Bible does, but um, again, I told you it was hard-hitting, but it's interesting that the, the insights into God, into the mind of God, that this book, Malachi, gives us. Don't we want to see into the mind of God to understand him better? And Malachi does that for us. One of the things that he says about God is that God would rather see no religious service than half-hearted religious service. That's a tough message. Through Malachi, God asks, he says this, he speaks about Israel's religious practice, and he says, Who is there, even among you, who would shut the doors? They were in bad shape, weren't they? And we see into the mind of God that if it's half-hearted, he's not interested in that, is he? He wants a full consecration. And so he says to the prophet Malachi, Boy, who is there? Guys, who is there among you who just go shut the doors for us? Because I'm not interested in what you're doing. And it's a reminder, it ties in with Revelation, the church at Laodicea, remember? That last church 
in the book of Revelation that's addressed in the, in the seven letters. And he says, I, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but because you're neither, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And so we see these this parallel messages in essence. The name Malachi means my, me- my messenger or the Lord's messenger. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi was a prophet, and prophets were these strange people because prophets would speak on behalf of God. When you think about prophets, you might think of John the Baptist, and and he was a strange character, wasn't he? He was dressed in camel's hair. He had a leather belt. He he ate uh, locusts and honey, and uh, he he was he was a, a a loner. I think we could say. What would we think today, right? Of someone like that, someone a loner and just did these strange things. You know, I as I was thinking about this, John the Baptist seemed uh, to have an in an in on what really mattered, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he knew what really mattered, that, you know, all the, the you know, the, the dog, the cat, right, the three kids, the white picket fence, ultimately it's not about that. Not that those are bad things. I have a dog and two cats. <laughs> but but uh, there was something, John was wired, was, was honed in on, on what was really important, hearing from God. Living for God. Prophets, of course, you, if, if you're a student of the Bible, you'll realize that prophets often started out with this phrase, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And if you, if back then, if you had a listening ear, you would be uh, paying attention. We should feel the weight of it, shouldn't we? Thus saith the Lord, the prophet's message, thus saith the Lord. Goodness, you think about it, a message from heaven, a message from the throne of God, that's how the listening ear would would have received the prophet's message. There was a weight to it, and certainly Malachi uh, felt the weight of what God was doing in him and through him. Look at this verse in Malachi 1.1. It says, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. This is the way many prophets describe this ministry that God had called them to into into being a prophet. When you think of burden, think weight. The word of God, there must be a weight to it in our lives. Amen? It must carry something. And when I think of Malachi and what he said, the burden of the word of the Lord, it says to me that we must take it to heart. It's true, we read the Bible, we don't understand many of the things in it, but when, we have, when there's a weight to it, we don't just dismiss it, but we ponder it, we meditate on it, and we ask God, God, I don't understand that, show me what your will is. Reveal to me your truth. And one thing is for sure that when we speak of the burden of the word of the Lord and this word that God gave to Malachi and the weight of the word of God, we never dismiss the word of God. Never dismiss it. Consider this burden of the word of the Lord that that Malachi was given as a responsibility, like a load. You know, animals were burdened, the the donkeys, they had their their burdens that they carried. And and think about this, that God was speaking into Malachi and giving him this load and, and saying to Malachi, Malachi, I want you to take this to the people. It was a responsibility. Note, Note this in this verse. The burden of the Lord to Israel. To Israel. Not against them, but to them. There's a a difference there, isn't there? The word of the Lord wasn't to be against them, but it was was to be to them. And even though the word in Malachi was direct and is direct, don't forget that God speaks that we might prosper. Amen? God is not there to destroy us. He's there to speak into our lives that we might prosper. And so the word of God, even though sometimes direct, receive it for for the purpose that God has it, and that's life, a purpose of life. 
Prophets, prophets were bold. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. What do you think of someone today who says, God told me? Now, let's be honest. I hear some laughs. You know. We run, right? Somebody gets in our business and says, God told me. Because it seems like we've heard enough of that. Uh, you know, remember there was a gentleman in Eugene, right, an owner of a lot of religious stations, and, and, and this is a common, the, the predicting of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? God told me. And remember all the billboards that were taken out, such and such a date, and books have been written on the, on the date of the Lord's return, and bets have been made. And you know your history, you know that in the early 1800s, right, many people thought the Lord was coming back in 1843 and then 1844. Some people sold all they had, right? Oftentimes, when someone says, thus saith the Lord, they don't get it right. But here's the thing, with real prophets, they got it right. They got it right. Like Moses is referred to as a prophet, as he told Pharaoh, look at this verse in Exodus 7, 17. Moses spoke for the Lord. Moses got a revelation from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And it happened, didn't it? And it happened. Of course, the Lord, the Lord in the Old Testament knew, of course, as God knows all things, he knew that people would come and, and say, hey, I speak for the Lord. And so the Lord gave a test. There's a test of the prophet. And here it is, Deuteronomy 18.22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. I, I find it interesting. Notice the admonition not to be afraid. It's intimidating, right, when someone says, thus saith the Lord. And yet God is saying, don't be afraid of that, but take what they say and measure it against the word of God. Measure it against the word, what God is saying. And today, even today, many say they speak for the Lord. And I say, don't be afraid, but measure it against the word of God. There's, a, there's just a side note that I wanted to just mention here as we, as we move forward in Malachi is, is that it's important to know that oftentimes, a thus saith the Lord, these prophecies hung on a contingency, on a contingency. And it's important to recognize. Remember, remember the prophet Jonah. What did Jonah tell Nineveh, the city of Nineveh? Jonah went there and he told the city that 40 days you're going to be wiped out. But look at, look at what happened with the preaching of Jonah. In Jonah 3.5, and then we'll look at Jonah 3.10. Jonah was sent by God to declare a thus saith the Lord message that in 40 days your city will be destroyed. And that's what he said. That's what's recorded. In 40 days your city will be destroyed. And yet because of the message, the people of Nineveh, the verse says, believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest... From the greatest of them, no one exempt, to the least of them. Everybody was involved in response to the message of the prophet Jonah. And look at the next verse, or the verse 10. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And so prophecies, I think it's important to, to just remember that are often like this, that, that prophecies are often warnings of the way things will be if there's no change. And it, and it speaks to the mercy of God, the grace of God. And, and it speaks to the power of the message, that the message is not just there to condemn, but the message is to propel us to change, to seek the Lord. Amen? Even though it's a... It might be considered a harsh message, as Jonah would certainly have been considered preaching a harsh message. God is there to use it as a catalyst for change, for life, for growth. And that's the encouraging thing. You know, you read the New Testament, 
and it challenges us, and it speaks to us. It's not there to condemn us. It's there to spur us on, to move us forward in our walk with the Lord. And it's important to remember the contingency, the nature of, of prophecies. But Malachi's message, um, like, like other true prophets, was not politically correct. You read, uh, take the time to read Malachi this, this week, and you'll, you'll realize that it wasn't, it's, it's not soothing to the ears, although there are certainly some powerful, uh, comforting scriptures in Malachi. Prophets were not politicians. Amen? They weren't running for any office. They didn't care whether you voted for them or not. They didn't ca care about padding their retirement. They didn't care about who they were connected with besides God. They weren't running for office. If I were to sum up much of the prophet's message, you, you kind of boil it down. Much of the prophecy in, in the Old Testament boils down to this. Get it together or judgment's coming. How does that sound for a, a platform running for office? Not very nice. At least that's the way our human mind would look at it. But it depends on how you look at it, doesn't it? If the prophet really spoke for God and there really was judgment coming, then it sounds pretty nice to me to be warned. I would rather be told the truth than a whole bunch of lies to make me uh, happy. Are you there? Are you with me? I'd rather be told the truth and be upset and be made uncomfortable than just laying out a wonderful story that I want to hear. I would rather be upset. And so I was, as I was preparing this, I thought, God, upset me with your word. And that sounds like, like, like a crazy thing to say, but understand the way that I'm saying it. God, let your word speak into my life and confront me in those areas that I need to be confronted. Again, prophets were these strange people, not strange in a weird sense, but strange in how different they were. So different from the people around them, the world around them. They, they carried the word of God, didn't they? They carried it. And they were strange in their boldness. Bold people are, are rare, aren't they? Nobody, I mean, no, I don't think anybody relishes in being bold. It, uh, you know, when there's when, when it's confrontational nature of it. But these prophets, they weren't afraid to take on kings. They weren't afraid to take on priests. And they weren't afraid to take on the masses. One of the things that Malachi said to the priests, which was the spiritual leadership of the day, just get a flavor for what what, what Malachi, the boldness of Malachi, his boldness. You have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble. You have corrupted the covenant. Now, if you're in leadership, you wouldn't welcome that message, would you? Malachi, he said it. He was bold. The, the prophets had this strange lack of fear. Whether you were the ones that held the key to power or or spiritual influence, if I could say it that way, spiritual authority, or you were part of the majority, you were going to hear it from a prophet. And I, my prayer is today, may God raise up a thousand prophets. May God raise up a thousand prophets that will speak to kings and priests and the masses the word of God, whether it makes people comfortable or uncomfortable. Amen? That's a great place to, to say amen. May God raise up a thousand prophets. To speak into the world that we live. Because we do need to hear the word of God. Malachi was an end of an era. Malachi's ministry began about 430 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Malachi was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And 
just consider this, that with the close of Malachi, there would be about 400 years of silence until who? John the Baptist. 400 years of divine silence. That's a long time, isn't it? 400 years before another prophet arrived speaking the message of God. And of course, John the Baptist's message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 400 years of silence. God has seasons, doesn't he? He has seasons. When we look out into the world, we see four seasons. Every season has a purpose, doesn't it? Winter, we may not, we may complain about the rain and the snow, but you're thankful for it in the spring, and you're thankful for it in the summer, and you're thankful for it when you're gathering the harvest. God has seasons. God has seasons. And each season has a purpose, just like in the natural. There's spiritual seasons also. And between Malachi, the prophet Malachi, and John the Baptist, we might say that God was silent. Although, of course, he was speaking still through his word and his spirit. But God was silent. They couldn't force God to speak. They may have liked to. They may have liked to identify and said, you're a prophet, you're a prophet, we need to hear from God, come up with a message. We've had this long line of messages, these long line of prophets. We've got to have another prophet. Surely there must be one, but, but no, that's not the way it worked. God had a time of silence. And I think that the seasons are important for us to remember in our lives, too. Each of us is going through our own season, aren't we? Might be a season of rest, of quietness. Planting, reaping, struggle. Each of us is going through a, a season. We don't all have the same season. And what I want to say today is be sensitive to, to the season that God has you in. Your past does not mandate your future, does it? God may be doing something new in you. Recognize that. Be sensitive to that. Maybe God says stay, maybe God says go, maybe God says serve, God, maybe God says rest. Maybe God says speak, maybe God says be silent. But be sensitive to what the Lord is saying because there are seasons. There are seasons. And we see that between Malachi and the prophet John the Baptist, a season of silence. Malachi was an end of an era, as I said, and, and he represents the, the close of the Old Testament canon, which is that group of books that we consider the Bible. Interesting that the word canon is a Greek word, and, and it means measuring stick, measuring stick. And it, and it came to mean a standard or a rule. The standard, the rule. Isn't that cool? The canon, the Old Testament canon, the New Testament canon, God's measuring stick, uh, God's standard, God's rule, the books that he has preserved. Malachi was, was, was considered one of the minor prophets, and of course not minor because of the message that they brought, but because of the length of the books. I want to leave you with this today. God had sent Malachi to a people who had become complacent and settled in their religious routine. Not, they were not in relationship with God, but they were stuck in routine. And it's interesting, it's ironic, really, that if you look back and you look at the context of Malachi, Malachi ministered to a group of people who were called, who were known as the remnant. The remnant. This was an incredibly important and blessed people of God. The remnant was that small number of people, that number of Jews whom God had brought back from captivity. Remember the story, Israel sinned and God carried them off to Babylon. Now, 
God had brought back a group of people out of Babylon to resettle them in their homeland. How good would that feel? What a blessing that would be to be once in captivity, once in bondage, once a slave, and now brought back to your homeland to be able to serve the Lord your God in the way that he leads you. There's a, there's a psalm that I've got to share with you. It is written by those one of those who had come back from captivity just to capture to capture how blessed these people were. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Such a weight to it. Such, a, such an incredible blessing that, that they were part of the remnant that had returned. And they had been there now at the ministry of Malachi for about 100 years. The temple had been rebuilt. The sacrifices had resumed. But they had grown cold. But because of God's love for them, his great love for them, he sent Malachi. He wanted their hearts to be in it, and so he challenged them through the ministry of Malachi. Malachi was there to remind them of the covenant that God had entered in with them into, the covenant of the fathers, the covenant. Malachi was there to remind the people who had fallen into routine of God's great love for them. I love you, says the Lord. We're in covenant. To remind them of the relationship that they were in with God. You know, the covenant between God and, man, God and his church are, is likened to a husband and a wife. No greater intimate relationship than a husband and a wife, right? And God likened his relationship with his people to that marriage covenant. And of course, when the hearts of the people grew cold, God would send a prophet to say it's not about the routine, it's about the relationship. Of course, because of God's great love for his people. Here's a, here's a verse that just speaks of God's love and care for us. Look at this, Malachi 3, 16 and 17. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So just imagining your conversations with your brother and sister in the Lord, and the Lord's listening in on it. Amen? So God, so a book of remembrance was written before God for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. The passion of God for his people, the love that he has for his people, how God loves it when he hears his people speaking of him and, 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 and are passionate for him and are concerned about God, what's your will? God is passionate for us. And we're in a covenant with God, aren't we? We're in a covenant. God has made us a promise. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has made us a, a promise. God has entered into covenant with us. So know today, for me to know, that our Christianity is not just ritual. Amen? It's not just a positional thing. And, and by that I mean our Christianity is not just about being right with God. It's not just about being saying I'm justified and I'm, and I'm holy in his sight. And then somehow going on your own way. But our covenant with God 
is so much bigger than just a positional thing, which we, we, we cherish, which we should. But, it, but, our, but it's about relationship. It's about passion. It's about love. It's about pursuit. It's about hunger. It's about dependence upon God and growth in him. Amen? Never get settled on position when God has so much, something so much greater for you, a relationship. Look at this verse. This verse especially stood out to me this week, Ephesians 2.18. For through him, Jesus Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit to the Father. That's what it's about. You want to boil Christianity down? It's about through Jesus Christ, through his ministry, through the spirit, having access to the Father. Not just standing before him, clothed in righteousness, which is an awesome thing but in relationship with our Father. That we can approach Him. We're not, we ha we're not cut off, but we're acceptable in the sight of the Lord. We can enjoy His presence. I think Malachi ministered to a, a, a reality, and the reality was that it's so easy to get caught up in ritual and miss relationship with God. Spending time with Him in prayer, Spending time with God in the Word. God really wants to hear from you. He really does. God really wants to speak to you. He really does. God wants you to seek His will and do His will and stand with Him as He is on mission, of including Him as we go out and as we come in. Can you say amen? Let's uh, stand and worship team, would you come?
Father, thank you for loving us and for being passionate for us. Lord, for entering into covenant with us and, and Lord, describing that relationship even as a covenant between husband and wife. So much uh, love and passion and intimacy there, Lord, that is such a wonderful picture of how you want us to relate to you. And Lord, may we accept no substitutes. Lord, may we uh, put aside all the things that would pretend, uh, Lord, intimacy with you. We, 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 love to, we love to do that, Lord. We, our flesh just is so easy to substitute a real relationship with so many different things. But God, by your grace, just draw us close to you. Lord, by your grace, by your love, Lord, that we would know who you are. Our Father, a God who loves us, who has created us for purpose, for life, for meaning, to know you. And Lord, may our lives, may, may our, our walk with you be characterized by just an ever-increasing passion and desire to know you more. Lord, bless us as we go from this place. Just uh, speak into the hearts of your people, Lord. We know there are physical needs. We know there are emotional needs. There are spiritual struggles, Lord, but God, we place them before your feet. You know everyone. Lord, you are a healer. You have told us to seek you that we might live, ask that we might receive. And so, Lord, we take these, these physical needs, these spiritual needs, these emotional needs, and God, we place them at your feet and we say, Father, would you bring healing? Would you bring clarity? Would you bring direction? Lord, and, and uh, Lord, any strained relationships, we just pray for that unity and that power of the Spirit to come over us and Lord, to bind our hearts together, even as the song says, with cords that cannot be broken. Lord, speak into our lives, we pray. We love you in Jesus' name.